Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. All right, joining me today on Postcards from a Dying World is one of my all-time favorite authors who has a very overloaded shelf behind me of just his titles. Um, and F. Paul Wilson, um, you kind of sort of were already on this podcast, but we did not intend to record that as a podcast. I was just picking your brain about the writing process for a class that I was going to right. be teaching. And uh, so you've been on the podcast before, but not specifically for the podcast, I guess. But the last time we talked was for decades for um, the Tony Boucher tribute. But welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Um, Paul is the author of two of my all-time favorite series, um, and that's the Adversary Cycle and the Repairman Jack books, but they all take place in a larger universe called the Secret History of the World, and I'm sure we'll get into that, but Paul, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad yeah, to be so, back. <laughs> so you just mentioned to me offline that you have retired from medicine, and that means you have more time to write. Can you tell me um, a little bit about what's uh, going on with you and the writing career these days? Um, well, I have, uh, the, the, the most recent was the, uh, the book from Forge, uh, Double uh, Threat, which there it is, which they, they put a nice <laughs> cover on it, but yeah. uh, it, uh, but they kept it a secret. It's, you know, it just, I never saw it mentioned anywhere. Uh, uh, so, but anyway, the I've written a sequel, which is Double Dose. Mm -hmm. um, I also dug out a, a cozy mystery I had written after, right after I wrote Crisscross. Crisscross was such a dark book that I just needed a palate cleanser, and so I wrote this light cozy mystery and uh so after i retired from medicine in uh, january 2019 shortly before covid you know, reared its ugly head um and you know something had always been missing from it and i just figured out what it was it, you know i needed i needed the supernatural element um i just need it <laughs> there was something weird in there and so <laughs> And I, so I put a ghost in it and it worked really well, well enough for me to write a sequel. So I had these two cozy mysteries, which are now being published by um, Crossroad Press mm -hmm. for um, under a, a name, uh, what name do I have? Nina Abbott, I think is the name I have. Um, let, me, let me just... And I think for the listeners oh, too, Nina Abbott, it is. Oh, so it's written under a pen name. Huh? Yeah, well, it says F. Paul Wilson writing as Nina right. Abbott. Um, always trying to get on that top shelf, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because being a W, you've always been at the yes. back. If you have a bad back, you never see my books. <laughs> um, and so the, uh, the one after that, the sequel, which is, this is RX Murder, RX Mayhem, will be coming out uh, maybe six months later. Um, I asked for a retro cover. They did a very nice job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it looks great. And and I think, um, well, that's really cool. I'm going to have to track that down because I didn't know about that either. So here's the thing. I think a lot of people, some people don't realize because you've been such a successful author and you've written so many books that you were still, still a doctor and still practicing medicine. What did that look like for you in that balance before, before turning, before retiring? Well, 
I had cut back in the nineties when um, I was writing novels, Matt Costello and I were also scripting FTL newsfeed for the sci-fi channel. And um, we were running from coast to coast scripting interactive uh, CD-ROMs. Um, Which was and, uh, way ahead of the game too. <laughs> I, I was burning out, you know, it was, uh, so I, I just told my partners, uh, I'm just gonna cut down to two days a week. I'm gonna do Mondays and Tuesdays and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would rotate through the weekend calls like I had been. But you know, I just I just couldn't. Something had to give, and you know, I, I I cut back on the medicine rather than cut back on the writing. Yeah, and we're all thankful for that. So you know, I realized too that I should give or go a little bit more into your origin story, and I, I believe you're you're lifelong New Jersey uh, New Jerseyan as, as it were, yes. right? And how did you get into genre of fiction, and what were the authors that they kind of first stoked your imagination. Um, well, I started I started off reading Tom uh, was it Tom Swift Jr. Mm -hmm. and Rick Brandt. They were a juvenile series. With you know, Tom Swift Jr. had had a submarine. He had a rocket ship. You know, and then I I. I found I found a book. I came across it at a, a friend's house. His father was reading it. It was called Space, Space, Space. It was an anthology uh, by William, put together by William Sloan, who had earlier written Edge of Running Water and To Walk the Night. Um, <clears throat> and I, I read my first adult science fiction in there, mm -hmm. and I just. I realized I couldn't go back to Tom Swift Jr. anymore. Um, <laughs> right. And so I actually had my father buy me a copy so I could you know, read the whole thing. And yeah, I had it until a few years ago. I don't know what happened to it, but I actually had notes written, recommended by Paul Wilson, you know, <laughs> certain stories. Uh, Dear Devil by Eric Frank Russell. <clears> that was the one that really blew me away. Um, and it, it, it brought tears to my eyes and I didn't realize that science fiction could do that. And so, you know, I, be, I began buying science fiction and um, I, matter of fact, I was just cleaning out my shelves and I came across this little beauty, which was the Island Ooh, of Dr. Crow. The Ace Edition. The Ace Edition. And inside the front cover is a one inside the front cover. I would write it. And that was the first book I bought and kept and started my library. And so, oh, wow. So this is a keeper. Yeah, absolutely. I have the sci fi masterworks edition of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I love that series too, the sci fi masterworks, because they, they um, put new glossy covers on. <laughs> on usually books that you would you have to find tattered copies that use bookstores that you know for but one of the things that i've really uh, enjoyed too about communicating with you and being and, and and watching or and seeing your feed online is that you do uh really as much as you know i do the same thing with dickheads is is enjoy the history of the genre and really enjoy uh, making sure that people understand like the history and 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 how it grew and i know some some of your favorites i know you've made it a passion to for example promote henry cutner as you know and i admit he i first heard of him through you uh at borderlands you were selling uh planet stories um collection yeah right and so um I thank you for that. But, uh, you know, who, who are the authors that you most think are undervalued from the golden age that you wish more people were reading these days? Uh, um, the golden age. I just read, um, well, you know, Kuttner, of course. Um, 
uh, Asimov was actually pretty good. Um, and he, he's now coming back and I think Foundation is bringing him back into Vogue, but he was, he was sort of falling uh, off the radar uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm trying to think of the old pulp magazines that I, 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 I collect and who was in there that, um, you know, Manly Wade Wellman um, and E. Hoffman Price were, were I, I, I guess they sort of overlapped into the golden age. They're really pulp era. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Frederick Pohl. Um, Frederick Pohl straddles the whole thing. Yeah. Um, he uh, started out writing science fiction in the 30s. Uh, he actually, at age 19, he was editing astonishing stories. Um, and he had like no budget to buy things. He was begging his science fiction writer friends, you know, send me a story, uh, just pull it out of anywhere, but you know, send me a story. Um, and then he went on to write some really, uh, Samuel said, oh, C.M. Kornbluth is, is not read enough anymore. Um, he, he and Paul would uh, collaborate. And there, there's some really, you know, essential science fiction of the 50s. Yeah, their I'm novel, The Space probably. Merchants, is probably the one that's yeah. most remembered. But yeah. Um, John Wyndham. Uh, I was Nick Willem, I think it was John Bain and Harris, I'm not sure. Um, you know, he, he's known for the Day of the Triffids, but he wrote a lot of, uh, oh, you know, the, it became the movie, The Village of the Dam, but it was called The Midwich Cuckoos, which is uh, an underappreciated book. I know, I know it's been made and remade as a movie. Um, a guy named Nigel Neal, he did screenplays, uh, mm -hmm. teleplays for New York, um, for um, BBC, I'm sorry. Um, and he did the Quatermass series, which uh, was really groundbreaking on British TV in the 50s. Um, and that was, they were remade into theatrical movies. Uh, and so, <clears throat> who else? Well, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. I think uh, Cornbluth, um, he also did The Marching Morons, which is an amazing story. If you haven't read it, uh, read it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> so, it, it just hasn't aged a bit, you know. And um, I don't want to, it, it's, I don't want to, you know, ruin it for you by. You know, All right. I will read it today because it is in. Is yeah. in this book, so. Oh, <laughs> um, well, and I want wanted to drill down on that because I think that if people look at your career and and if people are are this is their first introduction, some people um, maybe I th I know most of the listeners are going to be people that are very familiar with with your work, but if they're not, <laughs> that you a lot the majority of your stories take place in one connected universe, which is the secret history of the world. Correct. is what you call it um and to me it's more elaborate and more thought out than the only thing comparable might be the dark tower but um even the dark tower is is the ten, the tangential connections to king's work are are not as intense as what's going on in in secret history but what um i think is so fun about those books is that they work as thrillers they work as as modern books but on every page of the stories with what what goes on with the plots the weirdness i feel i feel your years of reading in in the genre um coming to bear and that's one of the things i love about the books so i'm wondering if you could tell are there specific stories that you consider like the light bulb moment or novels that that really like set you on the path of like I've got to do this too specifically I've got to be a writer um yeah well that, that dear devil by uh, Eric Frank Russell 
I mean, that was that that made me want to read science fiction and maybe write it. Um, the the October Country, now the October Game, by Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I read that in uh, Alfred Hitchcock anthology. Thirteen more stories they wouldn't let me do on TV, and <clears throat> that was one of those. That, that just blew me away. No, literally mm -hmm. sitting there, putting the story down and sort of staring and saying, what, what did he mean by it? What, what, what's going on? And then some damn fool turned on the lights. Oh, well, and then all of a sudden, my brain reconstructed everything that Bradbury had been hinting at through the story that was happening in the dark. And then some handful turned the lights on. And, you know, it's one of those, those last lines that you say, well, then what happened? And then, oh, God. And, oh, shit. And it, it's one of those moments. Where, and that's where I, I said, I've got to do that to somebody. I've got to find a way to do that to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and that was where, because it, it was in the dark, it was... He was he was telling, not showing, which you're not supposed to do. But um, he was he was telling you obliquely, so you had to do all this inferring. Um, the other one was uh, the distributor by Richard Matheson. Um, mm. I read that in the Shock anthology, and I thought his collection Shock and. It just, to me, was just a masterpiece of, of understatement. And, and, and both of those stories showed me how less can be more um, and how I call it the inference engine. If you can get your reader's inference engine running, then they're with you because they're helping you write the story, so to speak. I try to... I try to structure things so that, well, the example I, I, I usually use is, I don't want to tell you that he's, he's a, this guy is a, a lousy cheapskate. I'll just have him, he's at the counter at, at the convenience store. And while the, the clerk's not looking, he grabs all the change from that little dish they put there. That's mm -hmm. all. Nobody sees him, he sticks in his pocket, but you've seen it. And so you're saying, this guy's a cheap bastard. And so now you're writing it with me because I haven't told you, you you've made the decision. And so now you're helping me construct the character and we're sort of doing it together. And it's very subtle people, you know, readers don't realize it's happening. And uh, all that, but that's why they turn the page because now they're engaged. Now the inference engine is going. And, um, you know, it's a subtle thing, but I, I think it works. And, uh, and so that's all with the showing and there's no telling. Right. Well, and, and we'll get into how the inference engine works and in double threat specifically um, because uh, obviously it's fresh in my mind. It's the last book I read. Um, and I do want to get there, but what's really interesting about your career is that you started off with a couple books of pure science fiction, pure space opera, which really is important to this particular story in, in, a, in a bit. But it was really when um, I, I would say probably everything changed with The Keep, right? The Keep is kind of like the novel that well, it's the first story of the secret history, right? So it really introduces it. Even yeah. though th there are some short stories and things that are in the timeline, well, before it, and Black Wind is similar timeline. But anyways, the, the keep is really where this kind of thing got started. Um, did, that starting off in space opera or, or in, in those kinds of things, did you feel like that was going to be your path all along and or, or how did no. that transition happen no, i wanted to write horror 
I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you look at that that first book I bought, The Island of Dr. Moreau. That's right. a horror cover. Um, you know, I wanted to write, there was no market. I, I, you know, I couldn't find a place to sell it. Um, even even the cleaning machine, that, that one of my early science fiction stories, really, I looked at it as a horror story. Unreliable narrator, you know, bringing people down so they'll disappear. Um, you know, eliminating her, her fellow tenants because she was absolutely crazy. Um, and finally, I, I, I sold it to Starling Mystery Stories to uh, Doc Lowndes, who was editing it. Uh, they, but they did one story, original story per issue. And uh, Greg Bear started there. Stephen King started there. And we all sold our first story to, to Doc Lowndes. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And so, uh, and then finally, when King opened up the, the market, uh, I said, now I can write horror. So I sat down and all the horrible <laughs> stuff that had been building up in me, you know, for a book. Um, and I had been reading a lot of Robert Ludlum too. So, um, I was looking at all the, all the horror novels out there and they were all like uh, Salem's Lot type of thing, small town settings mm. for the horror. And I was thinking, all right, I'm going to go the other way. I mean, it was something I started doing back when I wrote Demon Song uh, for Gerald Page. Um, mm. Just take the genre and turn it on its head. What are the, so I was writing a sword and sorcery story for heroic fantasy that was the name of the anthology and i said well let me write a sword and sorcery story where the the hero never draws a sword mm-hmm. and and so on when i when i went to uh write my horror novel i'm saying well i'm going to do what they're not doing and then they're, they're doing small screen i'm going to go widescreen i'm going to go international and um you know, that was the Ludlum influence, also the Ludlum influence of not being able to trust anybody. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody's lying. And so, um, but I, you know, and I, I wanted to make the vampire, uh, uh, you know, a red herring in the, in, mm-hmm. in the story that uh, you, everybody thinks, the characters think, and then the reader thinks because I said it in Transylvania that they're dealing with a vampire. And, you know, my conceit as I was writing it is, yeah, he's pretending to be a vampire because he's something much worse. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, and the story still hadn't come together till I came up with those crosses. And I figured out how I could explain them because, you know, you had to have the crosses there if you're going to go with the vampire. And, but I didn't want them to be, Christian cross and I wanted to be something else. And so when I finally came up with what they are, um, bang, 3 a.m. in the morning, I, I figured that's what it is. And I scribbled it down on a piece of paper and then the book just fell, fell together after that. Right, well, one of the things that's that keep kind of also set you on a path with is, and I should say that The Keep is one of my all-time favorite uh, horror novels, the, the one you're describing. And um, But what's really cool is that the, the misdirection that you're talking about, you think the novel's about one thing and then it's something much different is, is a motif that you've come back to. Um, there's, for example, one of the Repairman Jack books looks like a haunted house novel, but but it's actually more science fiction and it has like a techno- technological thing going on. And that trick of misdirection is one of the things that I think you're particularly really good at is is setting people up to think that a novel is one thing and pulling the rug out from under the reader at some point. Um, It's a a trick that I think you're the master of personally. Um, And the keep was where you really started that. And so that was the, the part of the initial idea all along was from the beginning, that wasn't something you happened upon while writing. No, no. Um, I, I I need to <clears throat> I need to know I can end a book before I begin, and um, 
So I always have, I always know how to end it. I'm not, not always sure how I'm going to get there, but um, yeah. But I, I, you know, part of it came from a, a, we were writing letters back then. There was was an email, as you know, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough and I were sending, you know, talking about her book. Uh, I think it was Hotel Transylvania. Um, that's where she introduced her, her vampire hero. And I was saying, you know, you can't have a vampire as a hero. I mean, because they're parasites. They're, they're not good guys. And you can't have them as a good guy. I, just, I said, I just couldn't buy it as a good guy. And that got me thinking, that, that twist I told you about, what if someone is just pretending to be a good vampire? And, and not right, and there's something the worse. Yes, and they're hiding that they're, they're, they're something much worse. And, and that, I had that before I even started the novel. I mean, um, but you know, other things came up, you know, during the, during, during the writing, you know, other things would, would, would pop into my head and they'd, I'd make them part of the book. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something I was aiming for the whole time. Right. Well, and so you've done the Repairman Jack series, you've done the Adversary Cycle. These are these are long. Uh, the Adversary Cycle six books. Repairman Jack is <laughs> at this point I've lost track of uh, because there's a couple different. Kind of the YA, that... the YA ones. Uh, there, there's probably twenty three. I think maybe twenty four. Yeah, and uh, they're extremely readable. Um, so if people have not read them don't be daunted by the number uh but also don't be daunted by the fact that you can kind of read double thread on your own um oh and, yeah that's that's standalone really yeah and so a lot of these books in these series especially like the adversary books a couple of them certainly stand on their own mm -hmm. and i think uh if you read the keep uh, you'll want to find out <laughs> what's going on which is interesting because you did not have all this planned when you wrote the keep that it was an it was an accident oh no yeah the keep was a standalone the tomb was a standalone and the touch was a standalone um no no idea of connecting them until you know berkeley wanted uh <laughs> a, you know a sequel to the keep mm -hmm. um and they had passed on, on Black Wind. They didn't know how to market it. Um, but you know, then they did want a sequel to this. So I wrote, you know, I I, I plotted out, you know, Reborn, and it was, you know, it was going to come out to be a thousand-page novel, and so um, I, I broke it into three books, and uh, so Born Reprisal and Night World. Um, and then, you know, in writing that, I, uh, I brought in characters, I brought in Repairman Jack. Um, and, you know, Glaken had to be in there because he was in, in The Keep. And um, I brought in the people from uh, The Touch. So uh, all of a sudden, it was a six book cycle instead right. of standalones and, and a long. Uh, sequel oh. and unplanned and then and then Robert oh. jack took on a life of his own and became almost more important to your readers than than the original story that is that that kind of started the whole thing so yeah well it took me 14 years to do the second repair my jack book mm. I, I didn't i didn't want to do a serious character um i was sure it would take over, you know, I had other books to write. Um, the Touch was already written in my head and Black Wind had, had, was taking form. And, you know, I, I just didn't want to do a series character. That's why I left it dying at the end um, or bleeding to death at the end. And, <clears throat> but fine, you know, it never went out of print. The Tomb never went out of print. People kept reading it, keep writing to me. Um, so finally, after 14 years, you know, I, I did number two and then that sold so well, they wanted number three. So I did number three. And then, <clears throat> and then I said, well, 
I might as well commit to this and get going and do it. And uh, I was right. It took over my writing career. So. <laughs> but they're so good. <laughs> so uh, Repairman Jack fans are, are happy that you did. And, and I will say, too, that, and I say this all the time, but I believe Harbingers is book 10, right? Yeah. There. Harbingers has one of the best twists ever. Um, and Harbingers is my favorite sandwiched in the middle of all the Repairman Jack books. Um, and we can't really talk about it because... You, you, you got to read the first nine to really appreciate it. Exactly, and, yeah. And the first nine can sort of be read in different order. They, they, don't, they don't necessarily flow one to another necessarily. Um, but... That you one can't, you can't start yeah. with harbingers because then you know uh, harbingers definitely builds off everything else, but harbingers has a moment that was one of my favorite all time, like holding a book and going, ah, what just happened to me? Moments, um, uh, pretty much ever, um, what just happened in front of my eyes in this page. Um, so I, I have a real strong feeling about that. And, you know, it's funny too, is because I read ground zero because I was interested in what you were doing with that story when I had read the tomb, but I hadn't read everything else. And I read mm -hmm. ground zero and I kind of sort of got it. But then when I went back and read the series, I reread it again. And I felt like, yeah, I, I, I followed along okay, but it really wasn't the same experience without having read all the other books. So I highly recommend everybody check out Repairman Jack books. Um, the YA um, prequels um, help and they're fun, but they're not quite as essential, I think, as, as some of the it other is, ones. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. They do add, they add background to the characters, for sure. Yeah, and... and um... They're they're more fun if you've read the main sequence because right. you see how he first meets so and so and yeah. things like that. Yeah, so it's actually better to read them and kind of like after you've read most of them. Um, it so, but there is one novel in, in your past that is really important to this current novel, which is Healer, and I admit I. I've read Healer, but I read it many moons ago. <laughs> so, and I just, I didn't know until I opened up and read, read the introduction that these books were kind of tangentially connected. If I had known, I probably would have gone out and read Healer, I reread Healer a couple months ago, but I'm glad I didn't because I think um, in this case, I'm getting a new original experience, but can you tell folks about Healer uh, that book and give us like kind of a baseline for why that book's important to this one. Well, I mean, Healer was my first novel. Um, and it really isn't a novel. It's, it's, it's more of a patchwork of novellas and short stories and stuff. Um, That's but, how the, all the great ones did it in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was about a second intelligence. Someone's head is invaded by you know, an alien intelligence. And they share the same nervous system, the same body. Um, except this, this second entity is conscious down to the cellular or even the molecular level. And it was just, it was just as a doctor, um, it was some way of healing yourself. And then I made it so you, 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 them you could heal others. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, years later, I'm a, actually, I'm a guest at San Diego Comic-Con and Chris Morgan, who had written probably one of the, the best, and the, the last and the best uh, Repairman Jack script for for Beacon, just came down from LA to for a visit. He had now gotten involved in Fast and Furious, and he was a very hot writer, director, producer at Universal. And he was just, we were, he was just saying, "I've always loved Healer, and uh, someday I'd like to make a movie out of it." And I said, "Well, you know, 
most of it takes place in the head, you know, the two voices. He said, yeah, but I would, I would make Pard visible to Dalt, only to Dalt, but, you know, make it, he'd be visible so they could actually interact. And I'm saying, Jesus, that's brilliant. And that's, <laughs> and that's, that's a, a filmmaker's mind. Mm. He thinks visually. Um, I'm thinking what's on the page. I don't have to really think that visually because I let you do the visuals, but he has to think very concretely. And, and it just stuck with me. And that was, this was some 10, 15, 10, 12 years later, it still stuck with me. Yeah. You know, why didn't I make part visible? And, uh, and then, so I said, well, I'm going to do it. I'm just the hell with it. So I changed the setting from far future space opera to contemporary Southern California. Dalt becomes daily a, a millennial female and uh, Pard remains Pard. Um, and, but you can, you know, he makes his voice and his image you know, in her visual and, and auditory cortex so that this is, she actually sees the person there. And he can be anything, you know, he can morph into anything he wants. Um, and uh, so he decides on this sort of generic male thing because, you know, he, he, he always says, I identify as male. <laughs> and um, and um, so, you know, she resists him at first and, and finally he becomes her confidant and they're best friends. And, um, all right, there's going to be two books in the series, and um, the first one, you know, sets up everything because the second one is totally wild. <laughs> I mean, this is really, I read, I read, I'm flooding the whole uh, uh, Imperial Valley, and I'm just doing some, you know, crazy ass things. But uh, <laughs> so, did you write them together just in one? Brush? I wrote them back to back, yeah, yeah, because. Some, it was one story in Healer. Yeah. I, I've added so many characters and other things around it now that it, it, it just, uh, I can only get through half of it uh, in, in one book. So, uh, yeah. so I, just, I, just, I just finished one, put it aside, started book two. You know, it just, it takes up, it picks up hours after the end of book one. So, uh, Actually, they could be published together, but yeah, totally. Well, and so the thing with um, Healer was that you know, being the space opera, then you get this opportunity by being able to put it into the secret history. Was that the plan from the beginning? No, it's just the way I think now. <laughs> you know, um, that's funny. Yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, it would be hard not to put it into the secret history, uh, but it's always fun to fit little things, and it's it's peripheral to the to the secret history in a way. You know, it doesn't really impact on it. Um, well, I so think that, it's page one eighty specifically where uh, there where there's a slight there's a definite connection to the touch, and or oh, and there's a short oh. story that's set in the secret history that I believe it connects to. Uh, um, but so it's 180 pages in because I, I'll i tell you that my experience is that I didn't go to the back to see, because all the secret history books in the back have this timeline, right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> it's funny because I have a habit when I pick up your books to see if at this point, before I start, I'll look to see where in the timeline it takes place. And this time I didn't because I thought, oh, well, this isn't a secret history book. And so um, it, you should know that it worked in the sense that on page 180, when I got to that part, I went, ah, there you go. And then I flipped back and saw it. And now I'll have to go look up page 180. <laughs> Um, well, I do have a dog here, and so I can, so we can, when we get to spoilers, we'll talk about right. it. But, um, but this presented some interesting, um, you know, writing techniques for you because you're you're creating a character who is visible 
internally to your to one of your point of view characters but not to others so you had to think about like how am i mechanically going to do that as a writer right that it works for the reader so how did you work to solve those things uh you know it, it was it was it was hard um the audiobook had that, they had to have three narrators um <laughs> So, because there's there's Daly's speaking voice, Daly's thought voice, and then Daly speaking to Pard. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes she'll speak out loud, and sometimes she'll speak in her head when there are other people around, because um, they you know they they share the same brain, so they can share the thoughts. Um, but you know. Getting the uh, keeping the dialogue separate was always uh, a challenge. Um, I had to put I would put parts in in parentheses, um, which is also a lot of uh, is is nice because I didn't have to do all the dialogue tags. If you saw it in parentheses, you knew it was part speaking. And if, the, if if Dale is the only one in the room, then you know it's Daly speaking. And um, it, 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 I, I hate to do dialogue tags if I don't need them, and I, <clears throat> I especially don't like them in audiobooks because you've got a good you know narrator that they're they're changing their voice for the characters, and so um, yeah. I just find it annoying when it said he said, she said, he said, she said. Well, I mean, you're using the female voice and the male voice. Yeah, I, I know who's saying what. Um, yeah, yeah but, I'd rather be confused and have to go back and read, like, oh, to try and figure out who said something than to have too many speech tags. And what I think a lot of writers or non writers don't realize is how much authors like actually agonize for when to use speech tags and when not to. But yeah, you know, it's, I mean, sometimes if you have two very different types of people, I mean, when Jack and Abe talk, Abe's got the, you know, the, the, the New York Jewish accent mm -hmm. and he throws in a lot of you know, the Yiddishisms. Um, yeah. And so very easy with those two. You know, Abe has a has a certain rhythm to his speech um, and Jack has his own rhythm. And, and just by rhythm alone, if not by actual vocabulary, you can, you know, you can tell. Um, but it's when you get three people in a room, <laughs> it's when it gets. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know. And, when, and on our uh, recent horror short story podcast Laird Barron pointed out that um I believe it's PD by T.E.D. Klein is like one of the best examples of writing multiple characters in a room so people are I thought that was a really good suggestion I went back and looked at that a little bit and um it is really hard to do multiple people in a room and so now in this book what you've got is you've got multiple people in a head, <laughs> which yeah. is good. Which, uh, but yeah, like you said, that the um, having the uh, um, ellipses like really help to do to, to differentiate that. And what's really interesting too is is that because Pard becomes Pard is a symbiont creature to Daly, but becomes his own character. How much did you have to think about? Pard is essentially born inside Daly's brain, right? Yeah. So everything Pard, everything that is Pard comes from experience that she's had, essentially, but develops his own personality. So can you tell, talk to us about creating that character? Because that's really fascinating for me as a reader and a writer reading that. That was one of the most fun parts of the book. Well, I, I work under the premise that um, if you have a rational mind, you can, you, you can come up with a code of behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so his code of behavior is different from Daly's. Daly is a con woman. Mm. And Parr is basically more, much more uptight and much more straight-laced. Um, he also noticed that his vocabulary was limited in the beginning to hers. Yeah. And because she's, she's sort of undereducated. Um, she, she grew up with a family that didn't send the kids to school. Um, and she didn't get to her first public school until she was like 13 or something. Um, so she, you know, she's got a limited and her, her cultural knowledge is limited. You know, she just, she's just not that well educated. Um, and Pard has got this hungry mind. Mm-hmm. He's hungry for information. And so um, he reads while she's asleep. You know, he, he almost is at her eyes and, and, and starts going through books like this, you know. And um, so he he develops his own you know, personality. And then she finds her knowledge and vocabulary increasing as, as he's increasing his because, you know, that's all stored in her brain now. And all of a sudden she knows what things mean. And, you know, she all of a sudden, you know, she's, she sees some light and shadow on a building and she compares it to Hopper. And he mm-hmm. said, and she's saying, who's Hopper? Oh, I don't know who Hopper is, but how, how did I know? And that type of thing. So um, he's definitely benefiting from her, but she's definitely benefiting from him. So it's a, it's a true symbiosis uh, going on there. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, he actually starts, you know, infecting her with his ethics, um, her a higher form of ethics. You know, you know, you're too good for these scams that you're pulling on people. Mm-hmm. Um, aren't you ashamed? And and that type of thing. So, and, and that's one of the the subtext is that a rational mind can come up with with, with a, a a working code of ethics. Um, I even think that artificial intelligence should be able to do that. And you know, once it gets once it gets going, people are always afraid that it's going to be, you know, take over, want it want to take over. But you know, why couldn't it develop an, you know, a, a set of ethics? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll have to explore that story sometime. But, um, <laughs> I just read a really great AI novel um, called Machinehood that I would recommend by um, uh, American Indian. Uh, um, uh, uh, an American of Indian descent, <laughs> uh, S.B. Div- Divya, and the novel is called Machinehood, and I highly recommend it. It's one of the best modern sci-fi novels I've read in a long time. Wow. Uh, and, and she's a neuroscience AI expert, and so um, uh, very, very, very good. But um, but yeah, so back to to now writing those nuances had to be super fun for you um to to have those little details of you had to constantly be like keeping track of you know how she's speaking how she's learning how her language is changing how her and part like kind of grow as characters so that must have been a really interesting um exercise to write characters growing um in that way in a symbiotic relationship like that it was, it was. And, and that was um that's one of the things that, that drew me to um, reconceptualizing Healer because, uh, you know, in Healer, the science fiction novel, Dalt was a fully formed adult male. Mm-hmm. Um, and Pard was playing catch up. This way, you know, Daly is sort of an undeveloped, mm-hmm. still growing, still learning still developing female human. And and when Pard is sort of learning along with her. And- um, But obviously she's talented and she has all these things. She just, it Pard unlocks a lot of this, right? Yeah, I mean, mean, she's she's a crafty, smart young woman, but, you know, crafty being the operative word there. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. She makes, you know, she she makes, her basic living by, uh, you know, billing companies for services she never rendered, and then and because you know their, their bookkeepers are overworked, they just pay the bill because it's like sixty three dollars or something like that. It's nothing that's going to break the bank, 
and um, she just sends out the bills every month and and and, and you know, collects about forty thousand dollars a year just uh, for these phony bills. Uh, and uh, and you know, hard finds this you know abhorrent. You know, you're better than this. And so, you know, it, it, it was, it was, it was a lot, it was, a, that was a lot more fun than writing Healer. Uh, writing this one, uh, you know, the, the characters were just, you know, I, I just fell in love with the two of them. Uh, well, so writing, well, and you've grown so much as a writer over the years. That was your first novel, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so. yeah, it shows when you read it, you know, it shows. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a first novel. Um, right. As I always say, back then we were learning to write in public. Mm, yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, so, all right, before we get into spoilers and close out on spoilers, um, just to, so I think that's the aspect that that symbiotic relationship and the way that the characters, it's a very character driven story with this unique um, supernatural setup for um for what makes it a really good character driven story. And um, I, I think that's what really, um, to me, makes it an interesting and fun read. Um, you know, what's, you know, our last, before spoilers, um, what's our last pitch for, for Double Threat? Uh, because I think it also has, it, you sh you should, we should also note that it, that, Double Threat also has UFO UFO cults, Cub, awesome Southern California, like and and not LA. I'm talking Southern and Southeastern Southern California here in San Diego and Imperial Valley. Um, interesting locales and um, and and the Salt and Sea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Salt and Sea. Um, and what and you know you mostly have written a lot of stories that take place in New York and, and, and the area around you. How did, how did Southern California come into the story? Was it, was it just the potential for the, well, I know we've had UFO cults here before as part of it. I, I acknowledge that. I, uh, um, I, I took a winter vacation in, in Palm Springs um, years ago. And I'd heard about the salt and sea. And I said, you know, I said to my wife, I said, yeah, this may bore the hell out of you, but I've got to go see this place. And um, so when, when we drove down there and I, it, it, was, it was surreal. Um, and the smell was just, you know, it, was, uh, it, it was a very strong odor. Um, I can't believe fish live in that water, but apparently there are tilapia in there. But the thing is, it all used to be 200 feet, you know, underwater. It used to be the bottom of a sea that, yeah. that ran up from, uh, you know, Baja area. And before the, the Colorado River laid down these mountains of silt uh, on which, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Texacali or whatever it is, uh, uh, Mexicali is, is built. Um, you know, it, it was all one big body of water four million years ago. So you can still find seashells there. But you, know, you think you walk, you're crunching on sand when you go up to the salt sea, but it's all dead fish bones. Mm -hmm. um, they've had, you know, they had tremendous die offs at times. Um, and so, uh, and then, then there's the, uh, uh, the the settlement in Slab City. There, uh, it's it just just a fact. I said I got to put this in a story somehow, and it plays right. a much bigger part in book two, uh, the Salton Sea itself. But um, uh, but the whole area around it, it just you got the mountains on both sides, and there's this there's this haze because you're you're below sea level. Way about you know a couple hundred feet below sea level when you're there. Um, just surreal place. So you, it's kind of a place I couldn't make up. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting that there isn't more fiction that <laughs> gets set there. Um, yeah, I think 
well because it's isolated and a lot of people haven't seen it and if more people saw it probably would, would happen um all right so uh before we get into spoilers double threat um is out from um forge and it's available for uh you know wherever you get books and it also i did not know about the audio book that's interesting so is that um that that has yeah, three narrators mm -hmm. three narrators uh, uh and uh, you know the ebook you know so it's uh yeah. paper yeah. vocal and electronic <laughs> All right. Well, and then you're saying uh, double dose will probably get next year sometime. So about a year from now or so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So, OK, uh, you've been warned. Um, uh, spoilers um, are coming. We're going to um, assume that anyone listening beyond this point has already read the book. So we're not worried about spoiling things. So, yes, it was page 180 where um, there's uh pard says uh very impressive you don't have to ask about uh warden cliff because thanks to me somewhere in your memory bank is the now is that's now defunct town far out in the north shore of long island that comes from a secret history short story correct um, uh and not about a lot warden cliff yeah yeah cliff. yeah uh, but that's but, also a real place i mean it's right not Okay. And then, um, so, but that, at that point though, the, the, I think that also connects a little bit to the touch or am I, am I wrong about that? Like, um, no, no, okay. um, no, Tesla wasn't involved in the touch at all. Tesla was maybe, uh, um, it was broadcast energy in legacies legacies okay yes 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 okay I knew it was somewhere there all right so um one of the okay so once you get into this um so with the ufo cult and everything that's going on there becomes like a mystery and a thing a, a connection to this city um and i didn't want to talk about it before we got into spoilers but um you know daily being out in this area gets involved with this um this larger grander conspiracy and one of the ways that this is introduced to her is one of my favorite elements of the book and one of my favorite scenes which i thought was great which is the character who slips the notes under the door which oh. was yeah i loved that uh that the, the idea that he didn't want to be seen or heard i can't remember if he doesn't he can't speak he can't speak he doesn't want to be seen and so he slips these notes under the door, just one after another, and they talk back to him. This was a great scene. Where did this come from? It was uh, it was just this is really great. <laughs> I love this part. Well, now I, I I just for some reason uh, I I don't know where he came from. Um, I just I wanted um, Reese to have a brother. Or a sibling, mm -hmm. or some you know, a foil, he could bounce things off of that wasn't his father, and and so I, I, I just said, well, I'll, I'll give him a brother, but I wanted to make the brother special, in some mm -hmm. way, and so he's got this skin condition that's just ugly as can be. He looks like a you know the bark of a tree, and um, he just he just very self conscious about it, doesn't want to be seen, and so. Um, uh, he writes notes and he can't speak it has affected his voice so he writes notes back and forth there was you know they, they play chess and they communicate by notes and um he for some reason yeah you know, i forget the reason um oh yeah he wanders around at night you know he can't go out in the day he doesn't want to be seen so he wanders around in the dark at night and he comes upon daily and in her, you know, he hears her in her apartment. He goes to the apartment next door. He hears her in the apartment, and he, she, he thinks she's talking. She, she's got company, but then she, he doesn't hear the responses, and so he thinks she's on the phone. Um, 
And then he just finds a little slit. He peeks through and sees that she's alone and she's talking to the air. And this, um, this intrigues him. And then he starts, he, he wants to get in touch with her. And so he, he slips a note under the door. And, um, uh, and then that's how they build a relationship, which becomes much more important in um, book two. Um, yeah, I kind of had a feeling it was going that way. Now, what I like about it is, and I think we talked about this in, in, uh, in um, what is now episode four of this podcast that wasn't meant to be, but I love parallels and reversals. I love, that's, to me, that's the heart of storytelling. And what I liked about the note man guy is that he becomes this, you know, she has these voices in her head and he has no voice. So I like the reversal that um and the parallel the parallel and reversal of this character uh and what what that said about it so it's not just that it's creepy that he's puts under the door and won't speak to them that is something that's there but i like that it has like a fundamental parallel to the situation that's going on with daily whether it was intentional or not i don't know if you intended it that way or not but Mm -hmm. I, maybe maybe subconsciously I did, but not not consciously. Um, mm-hmm. And so this cult um, has they're very concerned about. So this character that Daly becomes involved with is a member of the cult. His father is is a part of it, and they're very worried worried about her and what she means. Is this? How does this cult relate to, or does it relate to um, other parts of the secret history? Because that was something that I wondered about as it was going on. And you can tell me that I need to wait for book two to find out if that's the case. But Well, you know, um, there are, you know, it's, it's, there are a lot of, uh, there are a number of cosmic entities out there that uh, are intrusive. Um, two, of, you know, two of them are really in, locked in a, in, in a war uh, over us. Um, but um, there are others too that you know, have been here and gone and that type of thing. It's, um, yeah, it, it just, I, I'm just sort of, embellishing a little on on the uh, the intrusive cosmic entities as one of the characters in uh, panacea calls them uh, mm-hmm. so uh, so okay so what what you're saying is is that well well the secret history comes down to a, a battle between a couple cosmic entities that doesn't mean that we're not seeing the influence of other cosmic entities and if this big um, confrontation is happening wouldn't that draw the attention of other cosmic entities that may have interest in in what's going on i think think. yeah i mean because um and we're learning more and more that uh you know the, the the fermi paradox is probably right on you know if there are so many other uh, inhabited worlds out there where are they mm-hmm. and um there is an equation that that says that really sapiens and you know sentient and sapiens are are rare in, in the galaxy um because of all the environmental uh hurdles and developmental hurdle and uh, uh, development, yeah, hurdles that you have to get over to to survive as far as we've gotten, you know, without either being destroyed by some cosmic, uh, you know, like that that asteroid that that hit and wiped out the dinosaurs. If that hit today, it would wipe us out. But it would yeah. Pretty much. Um, so we, we but we've also had a muamua come through the solar system and and uh lots of well i had uh avi Loeb, the scientist who wrote the book saying um i had him on the podcast he's the guy that 
has basically been mm-hmm. arguing that Oumuamua is proof of that we've you know, we've seen proof of extraterrestrials and he's controversial for having said that <laughs> you know but uh eh, you know also we have you know the thing is you know, this solar system is uniquely set up um yep Ju- jupiter is like our guardian angel you know um it, it, it attracts a lot of these comets and uh they they never reach us um and it, it might also shake lose a few asteroids but it is uh a uh a, a, you know a, a sort of a guardian out there it is and, very true it's very true and a lot of people don't think about how much they they should look up and thank jupiter <laughs> on a more, yes. more regular. Right. so and so and we haven't and we haven't wiped ourselves out we, we've had opportunities but you know and and there was a Oh, I forget what it, where it was, but there was a huge volcanic eruption that that killed off most of the life on Earth and most of humanity, and created a ge- genetic bottleneck for humanity, which we did come through. But you know, we came through with uh, we lost a lot of uh, genes along you know on the way. Well, um, and you you think about these things a lot because the secret history actually spans yeah. a lot of this. Yeah. Uh, be, um, in, in a funny and interesting way but what i think is really cool about daily and this novel and this situation this is why i say this for spoilers to ask this question is is that this cult might be onto something that pard's existence and and connection to daily might especially coming two months before the night world events right two or three yeah. months before um could mean that she could really mean something much much more than we're seeing initially in this book that she doesn't have bad intentions but does does this connection does it mean more i don't know so well um you know the, the head of the of the of the cult the clan he um he sees her as a threat, and it, it's it is sort of written in the stars since they are reading the stars that you know um, the duad the duad has formed, and right. the duad is here, um, and so they're afraid of of her, um, and actually you know they will try to eliminate her you know as things go on. Um, uh, but, definitely, we saw her get stabbed in the heart. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and save and that was a really cool scene and since we're in spoilers we can talk about it um like um i don't know i don't remember if anything similar happened in healer i i, I couldn't remember because it's been so long since i read healer but it was a, a blaster yeah okay so that yeah and and that scene um you know obviously i thought there you know he's gonna save her but how that happened and 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 all that was 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 really cool but uh you know that that had to have been a fun part to write too right the the yeah yeah um it was well it got <laughs> as i was planning it out and saying am i going to do this can i make this work yeah um, and you know, in, in the science fiction, it seems much easier. When this, it, it's it's much up, more up close and personal. And um, can I make this work? And also, I, I, but I didn't want her to be completely passive, because um, right. she, you know, because she's not only, she's not only hurt, and she's got a knife sticking out of her, through her heart, but she's pissed <laughs> that this guy went and did this to her, and you know. She wants to get back at him, and the, the way she does it, I, I thought was entertaining. Anyway, um, right. I think well, I be very careful how I wrote it, you know, because um, yeah, it's uh, I'm really stretching a credibility. I think uh, when a knife goes all the way through a heart and gets, to, gets, to its tensile limit, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Well, and one of the things that I like about, um, and I said in my review of this book that I sometimes feel like you write with a plotting cheat code because um, you're so good at putting these things together. But one of the things that I like too, and I want to get into the UFO called a little bit, is that a lot of times you take these, like these order, like the Septimus order and all this stuff that's part of the secret history. They're, they're really like weird and like, you like it's hard to imagine these characters being or, or writing these characters without making them mustache twirlers or being weird and then you make them believable and and i thought it was a smart choice to have daily be involved with the son of the leader of this cult because you you got a chance to see that he didn't necessarily want this life but was kind of pulled into this life and i thought that was a smart a narrative decision but i'm also wondered that the whole ufo cult was that an outgrowth of seeing the salton sea and thinking about it and being like what weird thing could come out of this or like how how did that aspect of the story come to fruition well yeah the salton sea triggered because um that whole valley the whole imperial valley it, it, was, it used to be flooded up to the uh past palm beach and palm springs uh not palm beach palm uh desert and palm springs um uh, or to the uh, saint uh, san gorgoni uh pass it was all the way up there um i was thinking well maybe these these beings that were here four million five million years ago you know frolicked in this in this sea um and it was like their little vacation place and um right and they got kicked out you know maybe by you know one of the other entities and um, in this weird forming of ecology there's this preservation of it and right got it i see where this is going yeah yeah and you know and I, I'm, I'm very meticulous um i wrote a whole history of, of the cult from its from when they found the the scrolls in in the uh, egyptian souk all the way you know down to the present time and family members names and things that happened also things that happened in history and especially you know, there's a lot of uh seismic activity uh, you know, the uh uh, the San Andreas Fault runs right down the middle of the Salton Sea. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have a lot of earthquakes playing in there uh, in book two. Um, so <clears throat> it's uh, I know I know the history I have of the cult, and I just you know use that as as, as a background just to make, so, to to make me believe it a little more as I'm writing it. You say. Right. And that, and that that works for me. Yeah, well, and for your readers, um, I think because you give it a, a sense of realism that that makes these things that you're like, you, you know, that on on surface level would just seem so ridiculous, and then you you've got to try and find a way to make them believable if you're going to write about these characters, you know. And, yeah, and I have to I have to buy, be able to buy into it to a certain extent, you know, uh, in my fiction head. And in real life, you know, I don't, but in my fiction head, I have to buy into it. Well, that's that Peter Straub quote that I don't believe in ghosts, but my imagination does. Um, I, I always love that quote. Um, but uh, all right, so writing to just, just to close out that the writing of Double Threat, what was the thing that you most were surprised by the writing process that something that occurred and how you were writing the narrative or how it was working that you didn't see coming um because every novel has those moments you know um probably in in, in book two there were um i introduced two new characters and um uh a, br a brother and a sister and they have a very contentious relationship and i needed someone to witness what was happening on the salton sea and i couldn't I, you know daily had to be somewhere else 
and Pard had to be with her, of course. And and the other point of view characters were otherwise engaged. And so um, there's there's a tremendous, you know, there, there's actually a an interdimensional gateway starts to open over the salt and sea, which I drain, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> and refill from a huge crack in the San Andreas Fall there. And it refills from water from somewhere else with things in it that don't belong. Um, you weren't kidding uh, when book two gets more wild. Oh, yeah, that, that was another thing that sort of surprised me. That, that thing, I said, well, why don't I just drain the salt and sink and then fill it up again from you know, water from somewhere else? Because everything's going crazy now. And I said, ah, yeah, why not? <laughs> well, it is two months before the end of the world. So, you yes, know, right, right. <laughs> perfect time for these things to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right um paul i i really did love this book um i it sounds like book two is going to be completely bananas um and i'm really looking forward to it but um i i and i'm really excited that uh well now that i know about these mysteries i i'm gonna have to uh, track those down as well um, I'm excited by your retirement that you get more time to write and looking forward to more deepening of the secret history. I should have had you on for Signals. Um, and uh, Signals was interesting, well, because it's more directly connected. And, yeah. and um, Signals was one that when I, when I read it, I, I, <laughs> I just was like, uh, you know, it seemed like that was just one that like just occurred to you that there's this little story that's that's there and then you have the chance to just go and write it you know well people like, kept saying well whatever happened to so-and-so whatever happened to so-and-so i said all right why don't i just stick so-and-so and so-and-so in the story and right. um and it'll answer some of your questions uh they didn't mm -hmm. end well for them, but, uh, you know, you know, yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> well, I'm sure that there's just little, I mean, cause you meticulously write out these histories. I'm sure there's other parts of the secret history that have been kind of floating around at the edges for a while. So we may oh, I've see. Got two, I've got two books I just finished. Um, oh, that are secret, secret history directly related. And other two books called uh, the hidden uh, combination be called the hidden. And um, my agents got them out now. Um, I wrote them both back to back, and then he's taken them both out because you know they they sort of form one you know unit. I guess it's a, a duad, a duology. I don't know what they call two books, but um, directly secret history related. Then oh yes, <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, hey, more secret history the better. Um, I I you know that's when people ask me what I want to do when dickheads is over, when we've read all the books, one of the things I threatened to do was to do a secret history podcast. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, there's part of me that thinks that I need to, I need to wait because you keep, you keep adding to it. So I just can't yeah. go there yeah. yet. So, you know, that's, that's the only concern that I have is, is that, 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 it's impossible to feel like you've completed that at any point because you're still I'll probably you're still keep going. adding to it, you know, want to be, you know, and, until dementia sets in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, it, the more secret history, the better um, speaking as, as a, as a big fan. Um, but anyways, so uh, repairmanjack.com is where, uh, where people can find the, yeah. the majority of everything um yeah he is uh, uh uh you did get kind of roped in by that character but of all the characters and i'm sorry that the uh that i i can't believe hollywood has not figured out that that this is the prestige thriller uh the the, the tv series they need to do um i i, I think he, uh so you, quite, tried quite a bit they're still trying they're still trying yeah yeah well We'll and see. The keep, the keep will be back. Um, we're just negotiating a a new uh, option on that. Oh wow! 
well um that would be great because uh the film got we the got, rights back. Yeah. yes the the film that we got is uh is, is, it has the is, same title <laughs> yeah it has the same title <laughs> Uh, well, it's funny because the other a couple of weeks ago, some I was talking to somebody who's a huge fan of the movie, and I was like, and I was like, have you read the book? And they were like, yeah, it's different. And I'm like, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and then I was like, I can't imagine being a fan of both. I just it it's it blows my mind. But well, you know, the one good movie, the thing about the movie for me is it got me a lot of new readers. That's true. That's um, true. That that movie tie-in edition sold very well, even though the movie didn't. But the yeah. tie-in edition sold very well, and and uh... right, yeah. Well, it is, um, in in my opinion, one of the uh, greatest horror novels ever written, and um, I I uh, it may okay. not be it may not be my favorite F. Paul Wilson. That may be Harbinger's, but I I think. Um, as just a standalone horror novel it's one of the best so and on that note um i'm going to uh um definitely uh want to have you back when we have double dose to talk about uh that sounds great uh paul thanks for joining uh postcards from a dying world it was a pleasure <laughs> thank you and I, I i hope your jets are doing all right i haven't looked so I yeah <laughs> All right. Well, good luck to them, too. <laughs>